An experienced and knowledgeable archaeologist can often identify an object or artifact the moment they lay eyes on it. For occasions where that isn't possible, they turn to colleagues, historians, or scientists for further assistance. If none of them can provide that assistance, they're left with a mystery on their hands. A mystery that scientists struggle to explain. Such discoveries are the most exciting you'll ever find in the field of archaeology, as you'll soon see in this video. In September 1990, a colossal geoglyph was discovered in a dry lake bed close to Steens Mountain in Oregon, USA. That was the beginning of a mystery that still hasn't been solved. Is this a recent creation or an enormous ancient work of art? It didn't take long to identify the geoglyph. It's the ancient Hindu meditation symbol, known as Sri Yantra, and it's been etched into the earth with almost mechanical precision. The symbol is over a quarter of a mile long and scored into the ground with markings 10 inches wide and 3 inches deep. Lieutenant Bill Miller of the Idaho Air National Guard was the first person to spot the geoglyph, but what's mysterious is the fact that this area has been used by the Idaho Air National Guard for many years and ought to have been seen long before then if it's ancient. No previous records of it exist, and so for all anyone knows, it appeared overnight. It would be impossible for anyone to create this symbol in a single evening, and yet it should be equally impossible for anyone to have carved it so precisely during ancient times. Who made it? Why did they make it? And how did they seemingly do it so quickly? Although it's barely known of outside its home country, there's an arrangement of standing stones in Willinkulen, Manipur, India that's every bit as ancient and mysterious as Stonehenge in England. The stones are in a remote hillside location, and their purpose is unknown. While archaeologists have guessed that they might be some kind of ancient astronomical observatory, they can't find any evidence to support the claim. They're even more baffled by the stones themselves, as the type of stone used to create the arrangement isn't native to the area, and so must have been brought here from miles away. Scientists are unable to explain how people could have been able to transport these enormous stones to their current location, let alone why they did so. While they appear to be ancient, it's so far proved to be impossible to provide a date for when the stones were erected. The people who live closest to them say that they've been there for as long as their civilization, and that each of the stones has an individual name with a meaning that's been lost to time. According to the records of ancient Egypt and the surrounding regions of the Eastern Mediterranean, the whole area came under attack via the sea by a mysterious civilization known only as the Sea Peoples during the Late Bronze Age, over 3,000 years ago. Nobody knows who the Sea Peoples were, where they came from, or where they went after their attacks. A 3,300-year-old inscription recovered from the ancient Egyptian city of Tanis proclaims that these attackers came from the sea in mighty warships and that nobody could stand against them. They appear to have returned and attacked several times over the next 400 years, but left behind no evidence that would help modern historians identify them. As there's no solid evidence, speculation about where they came from often runs wild. One of the more popular theories is that they were the Trojans, who went in search of new territories after being displaced by the ancient Greeks. That fits with the occasional Egyptian references to them being northern, which implies that they came from Europe, but it could just as easily point to them originating from Turkey or Sicily. Sadly, we might never get to the bottom of this riddle. The creation of the Ellora Caves in Virul, India didn't happen overnight. Based on the archaeological evidence, it seems that work began there during the 6th century and continued for four centuries, resulting in wonders like the Kailasha Temple, which is the single biggest monolithic rock excavation on the planet. The enormous network of rock-cut monasteries and temples exists both above the ground and below it, and appears to have been worked upon by Buddhists, Hindus, and followers of the Jian religion, working side by side in harmony. There are more than 30 different temples within the square mile that the site covers, all of which have unique features and decorations. If anyone attempted a construction project on this scale today, the cost 
would run to several hundred billion dollars, and so it's unlikely that anybody would even try. Back when they were new, they were even more beautiful than they are now, with every inch of the rock covered in painted lime plaster. Traces of it still survive today, but offer few clues as to who originally suggested building the cave temple system here, or what inspired them to do so. Our next stop on this tour is in Kyoto, Japan, where we find the mysterious statues of Sanju Sanjin Do. There are exactly 1,001 wooden statues of the Buddhist god of mercy at the site, each of which has unique facial features. The name Sanju Sanjin Do translates into English as Hall of 33 Bays, which offers few clues as to its origin or purpose. We do know when it was erected, though. The 400-foot-long wooden building was constructed in the year 1266 and named Renjio Inn by the Tendai Buddhists who used it. We don't know when its name was changed or why. Each of the statues, made of cypress wood and decorated with gold leaf, is a likeness of the Buddhist deity Kanan. It's difficult for archaeologists to study the statues because entry is limited and photography is prohibited even if you can get inside it. That means laws might have been broken by the people who took the photos you're looking at now. It's obvious that this was a place of worship for the ancient Buddhist monks who used it, but nobody has any idea why the statues all have different faces, who those faces represent, or why there are exactly 1,001 of them. Everybody's heard of the Great Wall of China. It's so enormous that you can see it from space. Far fewer people have heard of Jordan's Khat Shabib Wall, and we can't help but wonder whether that's because it's so much more difficult to explain. The wall is enormous, stretching on for more than 90 miles through a barren part of the Jordanian desert, and it's considered odd because it doesn't have a purpose. There isn't a settlement anywhere near the wall today, and there's no archaeological evidence that there's ever been one nearby at any point in history either. If it had been used as a defensive wall during an ancient war, it ought to be taller than it is. Had it not been for a British diplomat spotting it from a plane in 1948 and querying it with their interpreter, it might still be unknown today. That 1940s discovery prompted a full archaeological exploration of the wall and the region around it, but nothing of any significance has been found apart from the wall itself. We don't even know how old it is. It's just a near 100-mile-long wall in the middle of nowhere, and it defies all attempts to explain its existence. As difficult as this might be for historians and archaeologists to accept, the Egyptian pyramids don't appear to be the oldest in the world. It's more likely that the world's oldest is the Hellenikon Pyramid, also known as the Pyramid of Eleniko which is the most significant of all the Greek pyramids of Argolis. Aside from being a pyramid, it bears few similarities to its Egyptian equivalents. Unlike the Egyptian pyramids, it wasn't used as a tomb. And in reality, we have no idea what its purpose might have been. Dating the Pyramid of Eleniko is easier said than done. It's referenced in the writings of the ancient Greek geographer Pausanias which means it was already standing by the 2nd century. But a thermoluminescence test has suggested that it's considerably older than that and might have been built 6,000 years ago. In answer to that problem, scientists say that thermoluminescence testing is unreliable and that the limestone block construction technique is more consistent with the Hellenistic era. Perhaps they're right but the difficulties in dating it using any technique other than thermoluminescence will continue to prompt questions until someone's able to answer them. The origins of the human species are shrouded in mystery, and the harder we look for its beginning, the further back in time it appears to slip. Never has it slipped back further than it did in 2001, when a fossilized skull was discovered in Chad, Central Africa. This skull, which has been nicknamed Tomai, belongs to the species known as Sahelanthropus chadensis and is approximately 7 million years old. That's by far the oldest hominid ever found, 
and begs the question of just how long ago our ancient ancestors started walking upright and laying the foundations of the world as we know it. The skull's brain casing is only large enough to allow for a brain of around the same size as a chimp's, but the teeth are smaller than a chimp's and more akin to what we're used to seeing in hominins. Scientists already knew that the common ancestry between chimps and humans split away in different directions about six million years ago, but this skull is a million years older. The skull's location is as controversial as its age. It's almost 2,000 miles away from the Great East African Rift Valley, which is traditionally thought of as the cradle of humanity and the place from which human life first emerged. It looks like we'll have to rip all the existing theories up and start again. Whenever a seemingly out-of-place artifact turns up in an unlikely location, it prompts speculation about time travel, which is subsequently proven to be nonsense shortly afterward. We're not saying this next artifact is any different, but it hasn't been explained away yet. It's a tiny object that appears to be a genuine Swiss ring watch, and it was found inside a sealed Ming Dynasty tomb in China that hadn't been opened for four centuries prior to its discovery. The troubling object was found in Shangxi in 2008. It's made of metal, and the time of the watch's face is six minutes past ten. On the back, the word Switzerland is written in English. Our first instinct is to write it off as an obvious hoax, and yet it doesn't seem to be. While clocks existed by the time this tomb was sealed during the 17th century, watches were rare, and in any event, Switzerland wasn't founded until 1848. Possible explanations being clung to by scientists include the idea that the tomb was broken into and then resealed by whoever left this behind, or that a rodent burrowed into the tomb and brought the ring with it. However, a ring watch is an unlikely item for a tomb raider to be wearing, and rodents don't tend to wear watches while they're digging. Even more contentious than the Swiss watch ring we just looked at is this small stone, covered in hieroglyphics. It looks like an authentic piece of ancient Egyptian sculpture, and yet it was allegedly found in 1908 in Cowichan Valley, Vancouver Island, Canada. The story gets stranger than that. According to newspaper articles from the time, the stone landed in the garden of a Mr. Angus McKinnon late one evening and nearly struck his 14-year-old son, Willie. When he ran outside to investigate what had suddenly crashed into his property, the stone was burning hot, and he concluded that it could only have come from outer space. When his local newspaper ran a story on the unlikely find on September 5th, they did so under the headline, A Message From Mars. It's hugely unlikely that the stone came from Mars, unless the Egyptians managed to quietly achieve space travel without telling anyone about it. And it's just as unlikely that it came from anywhere else in space. Mr. McKinnon was apparently a man of good character, with no track record of making things up. But we're at a loss to explain what else might have happened here. Jerusalem is forever being picked over by archaeologists and historians seeking to prove the truth of the Bible and the Old Testament, and some of them believed they'd made a breakthrough in January 2018, when a tiny seal was found close to the city's western wall. The 2,700-year-old clay artifact bears a Hebrew inscription that identifies it as the property of the governor of Jerusalem seeming to prove that such a post existed during the First Temple period. While the Bible claims that Jerusalem had governors thousands of years ago, with references made to a governor called Joshua during the time of King Hezekiah, and another called Messiah during the reign of Josiah, no physical evidence to support the idea has ever been found before. On the face of the seal is a depiction of two men standing face to face with each other, both wearing striped knee-length robes or tunics. It's thought that it served as a logo of sorts for the governor of the time and was carried by messengers to demonstrate the authenticity of official communications. Having finally found one such seal, the hunt is now on to find more. 
The ancient Egyptians went to great lengths to pay tribute to their deceased loved ones when they were laying them to rest. Aside from mummification, grand tombs, elaborate caskets, and ornate grave goods, they also often painted so-called coffin texts onto the side of sarcophagi. At one point in history, they were reserved for royal burials only, but over time it became an acceptable practice among everyday Egyptians, or those who could afford coffins at least. Rather than dedications, though, coffin texts often took the form of spells or incantations. Some of them are difficult to understand, but those that can be transcribed often request or demand that the person being buried has access to the afterlife. It was once believed that only the pharaohs and their families lived on after death, so the appearance of coffin texts on otherwise unremarkable coffins during the Middle Kingdom signifies a change in Egyptian religious and supernatural beliefs. It's thought by some historians that the famous Book of the Dead is actually just a collection of coffin texts, but that hasn't yet been proven. It's in coffin texts that we first see the idea of the deceased being judged by Osiris and his council, introducing the notion that only the good and virtuous will be permitted access to the afterlife long before Christianity appeared. Subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications and you will be the first to know when a new video comes out. Thank you for watching and see you soon.